morning, Michael. Good, good to see you. And you may want to be in on this discussion a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, general ag issues and where we want to go and what we've done and what we need to do to finish up what we where we are. And uh, I didn't know, but maybe you know we you guys you other four are all on on two special committees, um, and we ought to probably the way I understand it. There's a a committee doing short-term issues and a, another committee that's doing longer-term issues. And um, so I thought if we went, kind of went through that, brainstormed those different ideas, uh, that we would come up with some ideas that Michael might want to hear hear us talk about or may want to even jump in and add to uh to work on just as you know for our committee and i don't know if hopefully you've thought about some short-term issues or long-term or just issues that we might be able to add on to uh one of these lists for the subcommittees to drill down and promote even further and maybe even a little deeper. Uh, we we certainly have heard from you know many individuals that have expressed problems that they're facing uh, that that we may want to address and like uh, Ruth you had uh, uh, your turkey Paul Stone on, and um, and he talked about maybe needing some help to set his turkey slaughtering business up, if I remember right. You know, that's a, I would say that's a short-termer issue that we might want to think about and talk about. Um, um, you know, the, the per we had a person on that spoke about uh, my uh, migrant justice people or migrant workers about um, their, you know, afraid of health care. And I think Chris has got that under control. But, uh, you know, the language barrier that they're having speaking with these people. And, you know, so we've got, we, we have a lot of background that should help uh, put this list together uh, the long term you know there's a other way other things there uh, the long term things are uh, like setting up maybe a, a new milk pricing system uh, where we would have our own milk order uh, setting up uh, the taking the dairy guys and trying to convince them to push back from dairy milk cows and get into maybe raising more beef uh, on the longer term side and a host of others. So jump in and and uh, Ruth's going to take some notes for us to put on the list and and to send to the two subcommittees. So. Why don't we all just join together and just raise your, your hand. We're all, you know, we, it's only us as far as I know. Is that right, Linda? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, just raise your hand. And I'll let you jump in. And Brian, Brian and Anthony are the first two up in Chris. So, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I don't think there's any... Uh, debate about the fact that the, the virus has exacerbated the situation with dairy. Um, what was already a very fragile system, and we can you know, look at various ways to try to fix that, whether we diversify a little bit more, or whether we uh, continue to uh, offer subsidies. I, I just think until we get control of prices, and we may never get control of prices as long as we're tied to that federal milk order. Um, even without the virus, this is gonna to continue to be 
the situation every single season. So that made it worse. And that's one of those things where you could, could look at a short-term solution. And I think we did. Michael's drafted a, a bill that would at least provide some temporary relief for the dairy industry. Now, whether we want to couple that with vegetable and beef and all the other types of agricultural products, I think there's some sense to that. And maybe we come up with one big number and then divide it up whoever we see. But certainly I think that's one issue that, that intersects well with not just the immediate situation, but also some long-term things as well. So are you getting, are you getting to the point that the, the dairy milk subsidy program for right now that we talked about the small farms, small certified, we put that on the, to now, the early short list. Well, I think so, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the milk pricing, you know, the tied to the federal order, we've got to have, Michael's got another bill that we were going to work on that last, that next week when we come back, but we never got back. And with this problem kind of gotten put on the shelf, but that's, um, were you thinking putting that on the long-term side? So, uh, or do you think we could work that into a, to, on the short term? Because that there's quite a lot to that issue, setting up our own uh, state milk order. I mean, it, it's, it's going to be, you know, we're going to have some pushback from them guys that are starving themselves to death with the federal order, but those damn co-ops have got them so brainwashed that, uh, you know, it's pathetic. <laughs> yeah, and I think for that reason, Senator Starr, it's probably more of a long-term. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think we're going to get consensus with, uh, with all the farmers and the co-op together to go ahead with just a Vermont pricing model. I, I just, especially not in the time we have left. We'd put that then on the, is everybody sort of in agreement? We'll put that on the long-term side of things. Yep. Uh, yeah, the, I guess I just wonder if that's appropriate for the task force or if that's more like a Senate ag well, it, thing it, independently. Yeah, I think you're right on that. Chris, uh, uh, what do you think, Michael? Uh, for the the task force for going forward on milk pricing, I yeah. think that's a that's that's definitely a long term. Yeah. Um, looking at the charge of that task force and 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 the the skill and detail it's going to take. Um, with breaking down the market and breaking down the legal constraints, it's it's not something that will be done by the beginning of June. Yeah, I, I, that'll be a committee issue then. Yeah. Long, yeah. Long time. Um, you other folks good with that? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Anthony, we're putting the dairy aside a little bit for now. Um, I see two. two Inter, very interconnected issues that we have to deal with relating to number one, hunger, and the need to provide food for Vermonters and then relief for farmers. And I don't want to say one goes before the other, they're clearly both connected. And I think the reason why farmers are suffering the way they are, uh, it has to do with the lack of demand. And the lack of demand means Vermonters aren't able to access the food that they need to have in order to stay healthy. So. I think we, there's some short term, I think they're short term anyway, it depends on how well the legislature can move forward. I mean, it's hard to say what's short term and long term in the eyes of the legislature sometimes. But um, I think that we should look at ways in which we can deal with both of those issues, um, providing access to food and providing support to farmers. And we could do it by funding some of the existing programs that provide access to food and help farmers. There's this thing called Vermonters Feeding Vermonters, which is run by the food bank, which buys food from farmers at market prices and then brings it to the food bank. Um, 
there's the farm shares program, there's crop cash program. These are three programs that help people reduce the cost of food for themselves, um, but also help farmers maintain those markets that they need to try to make profit from being in agriculture. I think that some kind of emergency funding for farmers who have lost market share. You know, we hear a lot about how the farmers are doing well because they have CSAs and those kinds of things. And that's true. There are a lot of farmers who have capitalized it, on it in a positive way, but there are a lot of farmers who have not been able to adapt to those kind of markets for a variety of reasons, whether they don't have good internet access or they don't have good farm sand shares that, you know, they, they need help adapting to the new market. So the idea of having some kind of um, COVID relief fund, in a sense, to provide farmers with maybe either grants or loans, ideally grants, so that they can adapt to the new market, new market situation. Um, I think that bringing a group of people together to work with the dairy farmers to talk about transition is a good thing. And that is the, the transition itself would be long term, but the idea of implementing some kind of strategy to, to work with the farmers to begin to think it through as a short-term strategy. I mean, if we're gonna be giving subsidies to farmers, which we're probably gonna end up doing, I think we should say to those farmers, look, we're gonna give, give you some money to make up for your losses, but you have to go through some kind of process, whether it's just a meeting or whatever it might be, an evaluation as to what potentially you could transition to. And I know transition is hard for dairy farmers, especially bigger ones but I think they should at least have to engage in a conversation about it in order to qualify for the relief money that we're gonna end up giving them because we're gonna give it a millions of dollars. And I think Vermonters would you know, be easy to say, we're giving them a couple million dollars this year. Next time there's a drop in the market price, we're gonna give them more money. And I think we need to tie that commitment that we're making to them with their commitment to trying to find ways to diversify themselves out of the problem that we have, that they're in. So I think, I don't want to ramble on about it. I've been talking more with NOFA and some of the other groups to, to look at some of the existing funds, uh, funds meaning funding sources that are available. You know, NOFA has a COVID relief fund that they're setting up. The Center for Ag Economy and, and Hardwick has a fund. I forget what it's called, but these are existing funds, which we might be able to direct some money to so that they can then distribute that money to farmers in need. So the idea is to come up with a series of things that would allow, and then institutional buying would be the other piece, I think, which is, you know, setting goals like we have, you know, our goal is, I don't know whether it's 15%, I don't know what it is in the bills we're looking at now, but I think we should set much more aggressive goals and make it institutions, schools and hospitals and other institutions buy more local food sooner rather than later. So again, so, there's more to be said there, but those are the kind of ideas I've been thinking of. So, um, yeah, uh, Michael, so we could like tie, take the money that's going to get shipped into the dairy relief fund and put language in that. Uh, do you uh, put language in that that we would move toward? We would also hold meetings uh, to move dairy farmers, uh, you know, some polite way of saying that we're going to make them come to meetings and and talk about alternative uses, usage of their farms. Yeah, yeah either meetings or, or a group of people that visit with them on their farm. It's, it is the kind of thing that NOFA and some of the other groups are thinking about how to go about doing it in a way that works well, in other words we don't want to alienate anybody we want to just make sure that they're willing to go through the process of think rethinking what they might be able to do with their land if they're not going to stay in dairy or partially move out of dairy i i had quite a long chat with gus uh, this week um i don't know what that day it was but it was previous you know they're all tuesdays from now they're all tuesdays they're all the same <laughs> well gus uh Gus, that's why we're, I'm going to have him on at our, you know, meeting. I told him this week was all screwed up, and and you know we were already too busy. And next week we would have him on, so he's going to bring Ella on and um, and uh, er, uh, not Earnhardt. Uh, thing of Dale Earnhardt. I mean, why would I think of that? They came race a car anymore. Um, um, Nancy Everhart. Nancy Everhart, right. 
<laughs> and uh, so uh, that's what I think he wanted to talk something about this type of thing through farm viability and in that stuff and and uh, I think that that uh, would help would help bring this about and if we ran it through uh, a program where they actually accomplish uh, and through an agency that actually accomplish it, uh, accomplishes something um, you know it could go in in a different agency and and we would just get talk back and you know t the talking days are we need some action uh, yeah running out of time <laughs> so maybe maybe we could have that uh, on the agenda when we talk with gus uh, i think l is a real spark plug and would get on to this and you know they'd set up a program and and make it all work, but I don't think we can have it just be a volunteer thing. Maybe by accepting this money somehow that I, I don't know. How could we do that, Michael? So it wouldn't look like we're forcing them, but it would strongly encourage uh, them. Well, uh, I think you, and this might be forcing, but you could have as a condition of acceptance that 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 uh, farm and forest viability will conduct a site visit to discuss ways to improve the efficiency of the farm, including potential transition to other commodities. That that might how's that sound, guys? <laughs> I think that sounds good. I, I would, and I, and I'm not saying this to be critical of Gus or VHCB because I think they're wonderful. Don't get me wrong. And uh, you know, Nancy Everhart has been an old friend, and I have a lot of faith in them. But I think I would like to involve uh, other people as well in sort of figuring out how to best go about it. So it's not just VHCB. Well, who... have a team, a team that represents a broader group of people, not so that we have more more ideas floating around. I think Extension has been doing some of that work, right? Yeah, uh, they work for they work for Ella at VHCB. You know, they work through VHCB, and that money that we give Gus and and for that, you know, gets shoveled out to the different groups that do the farm viability stuff. Yeah. Well, if you're gonna if say the every dairy farm in the state uh, applies for and wants the payment that's approximately 640 farms so you're probably and i'm looking at at ella's shop right now and i think she's got five people maybe three three to five people that that are are part of her farm and forest but you're going to need more than that um so how do we add that michael um, well, I, I think you could probably come up with a committee or a response team or something like that that's made up of representatives from these organizations or whatever organizations you want that can then coordinate on how they will provide um, services or review of a farm that accepts something like that. And it's not like they have to go through the review before they get the money. They have had right, a year right. Or more to go through the review. This right. is tied to it, but it's not. It's not a prerequisite to doing it. Right. Wait, is that so? That does that sound pretty good uh, to you? You guys are. It sounds like the first draft to me. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, so we got we got that one. Um, that's all in the short term stuff. Well, and the I other kind. Of Ruth, I, I don't know, Ruth, how you're going to write that down as a as is something for the committee that to take that up. But 
Yeah, I mean, I think that we, this morning when Anthony and I, our committee met, I think we acknowledge that there are some things that standing committees are just gonna be working on and that these new committees don't need to necessarily deal with. So I can put little asterisks next to things that our committee is gonna take care of. And these bigger things maybe uh, that the other committees might wanna dig into a little bit more. But I think my understanding is that these other committees are just trying to put together a, a picture of what is necessary for the transition and for the longer term. So having the, these things on the list, but saying, hey, we've got this, the Ag Committee has a plan is I think helpful. Um, but I don't think every committee is as awesome as our committee, Bobby. So they're not all going to have plans. I, speaking from experience, I think that's <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I've, never, I've never done anything without an A plan and a B plan. Because <laughs> usually I don't plan anything unless I am expecting myself to accomplish it. Right. But, here we go. So I just want to add another thing to the list. Um, in the short term, we had talked yep. about the migrant um, farm worker uh, sort of aid program. We've got some testimony on it. And I've been working with Michael on a draft. I sent you all just at the beginning of the meeting, uh, just forwarded you the latest draft that I just got from Michael before, just a few minutes before we started today. Um, and we're still trying to get numbers on you know, more precise numbers on the number of migrant farm workers. Um, but as it's drafted right now, it's just specific to migrant farm workers. It doesn't capture a huge, you know, the, yeah. the larger picture because at this point, sticking with, you know, ag committee work, it seemed more logical to do it that way. And also because, um, uh, it gets really expensive when you add in a larger universe. So trying to keep it focused on ag is what it is right now. But obviously we can talk about that. But that would that would I would add to the short term is what what would you farmers. what did you add uh, what are you thinking about putting in there to help them with the rules? So it would be the way it's drafted right now is a, for any farm worker, migrant farm workers who did not qualify for the federal stimulus package, they would, they would be able to get, and who worked during the COVID emergency, um, would get a $500 uh, payment, a sort of stimulus oh. payment. Yeah. And it would be, um, it would have, it would be state general funds. That's the safest way to do it. So it doesn't get clawed back by the feds. Um, the agency of administration would contract out with an, uh, uh, a nonprofit organization. Michael suggested the community action organizations as a possibility, um, but it's not named in the in the draft right now that they would then administer the program and take applications. There's provisions in there to require confidentiality. So there's no sharing of any personally identifiable information. Um, yep. So, and it would, so that's, that's the basic idea right now. The, the problem is trying to secure numbers. Um, and Michael, I've gotten a little bit more information since you and I exchanged um, emails earlier. And the sort of, I had heard, I had remembered that we'd gotten testimony of around 500, but apparently that is not correct. Um, I heard from Dan Baker, who is the UVM professor who testified to us and he said that UVM in, in 2018 estimated 672 farm workers, um, but he thinks that's probably low. Um, that Human Rights Commission is estimating much higher, um, like three times that, which I think is high. Um, so, but Dan thought saying 800 to 1200 in that range is probably, um, mm -hmm accurate but that would also include family members so i would think that we would just be doing it for the actual workers so 800 may be a good number so that would come my math's right to 450,000 yeah. now would there be any administrative costs added to that i would think there would probably have to be you know that the the 
they would have to give the organization at least some percentage to be able to deal with it because it'd be a lot of paperwork and cutting checks and that kind of thing and outreach. Okay. Why, why Ruth, wouldn't that be chargeable to the uh, COVID money? Uh, seeing these farms were considered, um, you know, they were accepted as essential workers. So why wouldn't that be able to come out of the 1.25? Well, I guess uh, I would defer more to Michael on that, but I think there's some uh, concerns about whether or not they would be eligible to receive federal funds. But Michael, why don't you weigh in? Sure, the, the concern is how the federal government would um, opine on funding uh, undocumented workers because they have um, they have expressed some um, reservation about uh, funding under the CARES Act for sanctuary cities and sanctuary states. Um, they have uh, been looking at things like, um, I'm trying to find my email from Becky Wasserman in our office has done um, some immigration law in the past. Uh, and one of the things that there's a Second Circuit decision in February of this year, um, which allows the federal government to tie immigrated, immigration related conditions to federal funds. So our concern is that some of these CARES Act monies might wind up with conditions about not being able to be not allowed for award to, to certain categories or classes of, of immigrate, immigrant related people. And, and we're just trying to avoid that kind of issue. Or, or that there could be an audit and right. everybody gets revealed, right? Yeah. But, but I think it's a fair question. It's the one that jumps to my mind is, is in the era of a $400 million budget shortfall, um, you know, we were, two months ago, we were leery of asking for a million bucks for local food and schools. Um, I don't know, I, I guess we can advance it because it's the right thing to do and see how people react or or what we learn. Well, you don't you don't think there's a way to funnel that money through um, whoever as a farm worker, uh, a farm worker essential or essential farm worker payout, and and not list uh, the details of it. Uh, what farmers were talking about? You know, maybe if we tied it to the other thing that we mentioned before about providing financial assistance to farmers who need to adapt or expand, you know, regardless of what kind of farmer they are, whether they're dairy or vegetable, whatever, those folks who need to make investments, whether it's, you know, a website or supporting their, their farm workers or developing a farm stand or setting up a CSA, there's a couple of funds that might, like I mentioned before, the Center for Ag Economy has something like that. They call it the Vermont Farm Fund. The NOFA has a COVID response fund. They've been, what they've been doing is hiring, I don't know whether hiring is right, we're gonna to have to talk to them about it, but they've been providing relief milkers for farmers who are under too much stress and are falling behind on their milking at times too. So there are these other funds out there that we could put money into and some of the money could go towards the migrant farm workers and others of the money could go to like vegetable farmers that need to set up websites. And I don't know if that, seems too diverse of a way to put it together, but it'd be one fund that is to support farmers in a time of emergency. Well, you think, Mike, or Ruth? Uh, well, I was, um, I mean, just to respond to what Anthony was saying, you know, I've been, as I have said before, I've been thinking about all of the stuff that we're talking about as a big package for agriculture and including the migrant farm worker payments as part of that package. And then also having the funding for the farmers who need things for their websites or like what we heard last Friday from those farmers, the farm stand set up, the, all that. My, my concern, and, I, and Michael and I talked about this a little bit, is, is that if we have it, it, 
I want to make sure that the money actually gets to the farm workers themselves right. and if we tie it to farmers themselves having to apply for benefits on behalf of their farm workers. They, we can't really use those string thing. You can only get a grant if you do this for your farm workers. Michael and I had that conversation <laughs> and also uh, just making sure that these people get their fair share and it's not dependent on where they work. Yeah, no, I actually agree with that. I, I didn't mean, I mean, I would prefer to do what you just said, Ruth, not do not go, not doing what I said about lumping it all together. I was just thinking about that as an alternative way of doing yeah. it. If we want to make it harder for the feds to claim where, decide where the money's going. I would rather be two separate funds. I really would. Yeah, Chris. Um, first of all, this is just nice to have a conversation with us and and why clear, you have clear our thinking um so i appreciate you setting that up i i've been i've been trying to think about some some themes and principles maybe that could guide our work and and the one that strikes me is food security this is widely documented well, that uh, should be on the short term list uh, and long term. Yeah. Yeah. And that the the you know in terms of the the succession or transition, I mean it was remarkable. I noticed Secretary Tebbets said farmers are are dying for it. That's new. That's something I really want us to take advantage of. So I like the idea of if we're gonna. Um, offer some relief to dairy uh, coupling it with that and, and logistically how we do that, we'll have to figure, think through. But that was just a moment that I, I want us to, to hold on to because that is different. Um, and then when it comes to this money, we want everything to work through the COVID relief money. We have an extraordinary situation where We've either spent it four ways, depending on who you ask, or we may not be able to spend it all. Uh, and so that's <laughs> that is incredible dynamic. And um, it seems to me, you, you mentioned, Mr. Chair, a, a plan A and a plan B. We ought to have a good backup plan ourselves, and it can be informed. We can use it to inform the task forces to share it more broadly with the Senate. To, to really have some good strategies in place. If we, in fact, land at a time when people are going, we're going to lose some of this money. We need to figure out how to spend it. When you think well, about- don't worry, don't worry, Chris. The big dogs will eat, eat it all in the bones too if we let them have it. If we can solve the puzzle though. And so as we think about you know, uh, the, the, the sort of straightforward, this farmer had to invest in this website, this whatever, this contingency plan because of COVID, that seems straightforward and we should help farmers in that situation who've had clear expenses related to COVID. That's what the money is, everybody understands is for. But to me, the food security um, principle should also come to play where we're saying, let's have these investments solve two problems, solve the short term and start to address the food security. And that's where, you know, that will be, that will require some creative thinking. Um, and, and so it's obvious if people need to invest to, recover from loss of income. And, and you know, there's a story in the free press about some Heinsberg farmers that pivoted quickly and managed to using Front Porch Forum, sell all their products that were supposed to go to uh, restaurants. You had, we had that same uh, example from Madison County the other day. So it's working for people. My question is, what about the farmers that are actually seeing increased demand and they don't have the infrastructure themselves. They don't have the washing station. They don't have the freezing station, whatever it is. How do we help them so that we're more resilient in October when the next round comes and we want to be touching, we want to be uh, protecting against food insecurity? Um, 
and I and I and then I would just add and I finish my list and um, I think it's essential if we're going to help dairy and I understand that people feel we need to do that. There are going to be people that will bring up water quality and they are going to bring up the fact that funding for water quality work last year, we were all very proud. I played a role in finance to link it to a portion of the meals and rooms tax. <laughs> so we're, I don't know how we're going to figure that out. That's not for uh, this committee to figure out, but that is a real dynamic that we, as of this moment, are not clear how we're going to meet our federal lawsuit clean water obligation. And so we need to be careful um, if we're, uh, you know, as some might characterize, going to be bailing out dairy at the very same time that we're going to struggle to come up with water quality money, there needs to be a linkage. And so this transition plan is at a minimum uh, something I need to feel comfortable and I think uh, allows us to support farmers in a way that is um, more sustainable. I, I, I just, even if we are struggling to get the money out the door or return it, I really want us to see us investing in dollars that are going to also pay dividends in two years. Well, Gary, it's hard to justify that, to be frank, from my point. Why, why can't we buy water quality practices on farms, you know, that they have to continue to, to meet their water quality standards and, and this you know, this extra money we're going to give them should allow them to, to do that. Or be Can in good standing. That, that, that together, Michael? Well, I heard like four different proposals there. Um, <laughs> so, so, A, uh, the last thing I heard was Senator Pearson saying that they have to be in good standing. That would be very easy to do because there's a definition of good standing in statute that you could just link to as as um, a requirement for for assistance. Uh, the what? the the proposal by the chair to have them to to be in compliance. Well, they're already required to be in compliance, um, but you could say that they would need to use a percentage of whatever they receive on a, wa a documented water quality project. Um, hmm, that's a good idea. And, uh, and then um, I can't remember what the third proposal I heard was. Rose? Uh, yeah, I, I just, want to say, I, I mean, I agree with Chris that we need to have the short term and the long term in perspective and anything we can do to uh, ensure that we don't have this problem in the future would be great. Um, and I, 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 I'm not sure that I think have uh, requiring them to be in good standing is a really good idea, especially if there's already a statutory definition that Michael can link it to. I'm, I'm not sure that we could, it would, I don't know, fair is the right word, but if it would be okay to link it to, you have to use this money for a water quality project. No, the I whole point of this would be is to help them through this crisis. I, I think linking it to, if you accept this money, you have to um, agree to um, transition counseling or planning or whatever we want to call it um, to uh, with VHCB and the Farm Viability Program and their partners and we can sort of make it more broad if you want to but um, that that they have to go through this kind of planning process to see if they are viable for longer than 2020 and that if they're not viable they can take this money and help transition to another thing but that muddying the waters, no pun intended, with also linking it to them doing a water quality project, I think would divert the attention away from the transition to um, 
a longer term solution for farming. I also want to make sure that if they do transition, they, they maintain themselves as a farm because we don't want them to just say, oh, we're going to transition yeah. to development good. and then develop. Yeah, we'll transition. <laughs> yeah. That would be a good one, transition into housing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, housing is one thing, but- Be profitable. You know, it, we, want it to, we want it to remain farmland and viable, yeah. environmentally friendly, uh, economically sustainable farmland. And that may not be dairy, that might be something else, but yeah. we still want them to be farms. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Senator. So I agree with Ruth. I think the more strings you put on this um, COVID money, uh, the harder it gets to justify getting it, for one thing, um, and the more likely that there may be some federal roadblocks that, that you're actually creating that you don't need to. So if I can just go back, I think the five of us are all in agreement that we want to help dairy farmers, we want to help vegetable farmers, we want to help beef farmers, and we want to help migrant workers. Those to me are the four groups that need our attention. If I'm remembering back, and Michael can correct me if I'm wrong, the draft that we had had about $8.8 .8 million set aside as an appropriation request for uh, the dairy farms, depending on the size of the farm. I guess what I'm wondering about is could, if we could make that a larger number and somehow include all the rest of this in it without what are you doing it's up to, it's up to 42 or 3 million now it is yeah that's good <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know where the heck it's gonna go but yeah. how did it go from 8.8 .8 to 40. Well, Anson got mixed up in it somehow with those farmers from Franklin County and and uh, yeah, they're losing uh, they're losing the farm dairy farmers together all together are losing uh, about fourteen million dollars a month. So somehow it got up to 42, 43 million in, in losses. And that's for only three months. So because milk went from like $19 to $12, $12.50, $12 and a half. And so those numbers got way out of, way out of whack. And, I think that's why uh, we could put in the language that, you know, they should be in good standing with, with the state of Vermont and that, um, that they should band together or uh, to be a long term, to a long term viability and, and um, consistent programs rather than, uh, you know, write that language in there where they would have to attend some planning meetings for long-term sustainability. Okay, well, I guess I'll back right out of the conversation then because I, I have things <laughs> on a much smaller scale. But Well, I'm sure that number's going to get worked down. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a, lot, that's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I think... I, Go ahead, Ruth. Uh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, 40 million, that's that's way bigger than what we were talking about. And I understand they're taking those huge losses, but I don't I don't know that we're going to be able to get that kind of money and and that it's going to give us a bang for our buck. And I, I just that's, a, you know, the eight million that are 10 million where that range we were talking about seemed reasonable to me. But 40 million, I just, I just don't see that as something that we're going to be able to get. Um, and and, the, and to Brian and, and and Anthony both mentioned the sort of other farm things. I, I got some numbers from Michael, who got them from Ryan, about the number of farms, non-dairy farms, and there were 53, I believe, Michael, um, that are certified farms. And so if we did a grant program for you know, non-dairy certified farms um, with a grant capped at maybe $5,000 per farm, 
that they could use for um, COVID related expenses, whether it's hiring a consultant to do their website or revamping their, you know, turkey processing or whatever, you know, setting up a farm stand, whatever it is, that would be a so, sort of smaller grant program for the diversified farms to help them through. Okay. And I would just, I would just, I want to go back to one thing Chris mentioned before, because I think part of it is when you talk about the grants, Ruth, to adapt, we, we use the website as the example, because it's an easy example to use, but it, some of them may need to expand, as Chris mentioned, to meet the needs as well. So we should, it's about adapting and expanding, but I also just want to go back to the, I mean, the $40 million, I mean, to be blunt, to invest $40 million in a failing industry, when you've got a lot of folks out there who are on an industry that's forward thinking around vegetables and meat and other kinds of products, I mean, it's hard to justify $40 million to a failing industry without putting something comparable into a, an actually growing industry. So I'm not saying we would have comparability, meaning we're gonna do 40 million here, 40 million there. I'm saying that 40 million sounds like a lot to begin with. Yeah, that I'm sure that figure is going to get, you know, chopped way down. I mean, to get. I mean, some we could spend forty million dollars on agriculture moving forward and make sure that it, it spread out to other kinds of producers. I mean, that would be one way of looking at it. I, I wouldn't mind spending forty million dollars on agriculture to get it back on track and help it grow and adapt to the future. But forty million dollars just to one part of agriculture doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, Brian, and Chris. <laughs> And I'm sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to jump ahead. I'll be really quick, though. Um, I like Ruth's idea of a grant versus uh, doing something else, because let's remember, every time we ask someone to prove that they've lost money, especially vegetable to me, um, that means someone in an administrative capacity in some office somewhere has to take time to look at that and make a judgment. And we're just adding admin costs to this over and over and over again. I think it's easier to just say, Here's whatever the number is. If it's $5,000, great. You figure out how best to make it work for you. And, you know, there we go. Yeah, See, agree. I, I, sorry, Chris, I just want to mention, Michael said in the when I was talking to him, a sort of self-certifying process where they say these expenses are related yeah. to reacting okay. to the COVID crisis. And they self-certify that so that they have to sign something saying that that's yeah. what it's for. Okay. See, I before I get to your Chris, um, I thought, you know, under we have non-certified, we have certified small farms, and we have uh, small farms. And I thought that under the small farms act, and the all the certified farms would be covered under our plan. And the small under under certified farms would also be in there. Am I wrong on that, Michael? Uh, no. And in, in what you propose for dairy, the small farm certified, small, medium, and large would all receive a a, a payment based on their category. I think what Senator Hardy was referencing were those farms that are not dairy that are certified small farm medium farm and there's a couple that are large farm um, and how to get assistance to them i do think you then have the issue of those small farms that are non-dairy and how to get assistance to them as well i i think the program that you were just talking about of, of a self-certification of losses or, or expenses um, due to COVID. I, th I think you could do that with uh, um, kind of based on USDA's disaster relief assistance uh, and with a significant kind of consequence if there's any fraud or, or mis- you know, intentional misstatement in the application process. And Michael, could that be done through some kind of nonprofit or would it have to be done through a government agency like you do the community, loan, community loan fund or the farm fund that, that's up in Hardwick? I'm just wondering if it needs to go through some bigger bureaucracy or whether we could give money to a nonprofit and have them distribute it. Well, Maybe we I, 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 I can't speak for the agency, but I, I think 
I think the agency might support that because uh, they're going to be facing budget pressure, including potential furlough of staff. Uh, they already are pretty straight out, um, in my opinion, maybe not in others. Uh, so if, if subcontracting with someone to, to implement a program might be the best administratively efficient way to do it. Right. Chris? Uh, I, I just wanted to throw in there, the, the, did you say 53, Senator Hardy, a, a certified non-dairy farms? It, there, that has got to be just a small portion of the people that I'm hoping we can reach. Because I, 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 but I don't know. I mean, that seems really small to me. So I guess I'm wondering, do you see, Mr. Chair, that the non-certified small farmers is a whole another, you know, tier. Um, well, can I ask we, this? We have a lot of farm. We, we, I don't know. We have over a thousand farms. Um, right. I, I want to say even like 1400 or something, 1300. So I, I hope we'll just pay some attention there and, and obviously have that factor into our calculations. Cause it seems, you know, the, if they're small certified that I'm guessing is animals, um, Anyway, I don't fully understand all of that, but I don't want us to leave thousands out. Could I ask, clarifying, Michael, or my someone, what, what do we mean by these small certified farmers? Who are they? What makes them certified? As uh, opposed to farmers that I've run into at the farmer's market who are not necessarily certified. Uh, they might be certified. The certification right. requirements are in um, the RAPs, and it's section... I think it's 4.1, it might be 3.1. Hold on a second. Um, there's uh, requirements for when you submit a certification. Um, there, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it now. It's just a question. So, to... so here it is. A, a certified small farm means a parcel or parcel of land on which 10 or more acres are used for the raising, feeding, or management of livestock that house no more than the number of animals specified in, in statute, um, which is 199 cows, and then the Noah's Ark, that house at least the following um, numbers of that livestock, which I'm not going to go through. Um, but it's livestock. Those are livestock no, farms. No, it's not just livestock. No, um, it's all. It's, it's farms on a parcel or parcel of land greater than 50 acres used for the preparation, tilling, fertilization, planting, protection, irrigation, and harvesting of annual cropland. So a 50 acre farm or bigger, um, or farms on a parcel or parcel of land greater than 50 acres used for preparation, tilling, etc., cetera, um, where fertilizer, manure, ag waste are mechanically applied. Um, or one that the secretary has designated on a case-by-case -case basis. So you've got the farms that are based on animal numbers. Then you have the farms that are based on uh, acreage um, and their harvesting of cropland. And then you have the farms that are used for harvesting vegetable production where fertilizer, manure, or ag waste are mechanically applied. So I just want to go back to what Chris said. I, I want to be clear. I well, want to be to supporting other farmers, not just these small certified farmers. Well, the way you get, the way Michael and I got to the numbers, if you're small certified, uh, you have a number, right, Mike? We had a number there. If you're right. me medium size, you have a, a a low number for cows to a medium number, like up to 700. And then the big farms are from 700 on up. So you start at the top and you subtract your way down through and it leaves you the number at the end, which would be small farms not certified. I thought that's how we came up with that number, right, Michael? Right, for, for dairy, the small non-certified firms, are, there's 271. 
And there's 268 certified small farms for dairy. There's 105 medium farms that are dairy and that there are 33 large farms that are dairy. Now there are 53 other farms, whether they're beef or heifer or vegetable or hemp that are either certified small farm, medium farm or large farm. So that leaves the difference between the, that, that, if you add that to the number of dairies, that, that will basically get you 700 farms. And then the difference is whatever existing farms that there are, which is between 12 and 1300. So you, you have about 500 to 600 farms that are not dairy and not certified medium or large farm. Can I just um, mention, thank you, Michael, for explaining that. Um, <laughs> and my, my intention was not to leave out all of those uh, other non-certified farms. It was, uh, I was just trying to get numbers. And so Anthony, I would agree, and Chris or whoever said it, um, that we want to try to help those non-certified farms. The question is, you know, they're pretty small. So, um, you know, we make it say if you're a certified farm, you could get up to 5,000 because those are the bigger ones. And if you're non-certified, you could maybe get up to 1,500 or 2,500 or whatever we put it at. Because if, we if we're talking about 600 farms, it could get really expensive really fast. Um, and they're really tiny farms. So, um, sure, but, but Bobby got us 40 million, so. Okay, I mean, if we have 40 million, then yeah, let's, let's, let's absolutely do that, Bobby. Let's find out the universe and go from there. I, I, well, we're it, all would be, it would be easy, I think, to put, Michael, you have the number, we can figure the numbers, and those little guys that, you know, that don't do a lot, but yet they do enough to con be considered a farmer, I think you have to generate a certain amount of money to qualify to be called a farmer for tax purposes. And we certainly wanted to do something for the other farm sectors anyway, but maybe we could set, if they are fairly relatively small, uh, set them others at 2,500, um, 2500 a piece or something like that. Did our maple producers get whacked because he couldn't congregate and No, nah, they they're making they're doing well okay. as far as I know. I mean, you'll get the Dave Marvins of the world that'll come in, and, oh, it's rough. You know, I need money for this or I need money for hell with the PPP program and and those things, those guys are going to come out of this making money. Um, but anyways, um, I mean, unless you guys have heard something different, um, you know, I, mean, I think. I, the I maple, think that, sorry, Bobby, the maple no, weekend but, was canceled, That the open house weekend. So I don't know how much money they, they make from that. But that was the one thing that, that got canceled that usually is a big big affair for maple because that was what the third weekend in march or whatever um, you mean the same with the same thing I'm, I'm thinking of the saint albans maple festival also i think yeah, that, they're, they're all the same weekend around the state those yeah. maple festivals and they were yeah. all canceled i'm not sure how much that affected bottom lines though i think a lot of that is just not i don't want to say for show but it's to promote the idea of maple i don't know yeah, that yeah. they actually sell a lot of stuff during that time. Maybe they yeah. did. No, you're probably yeah. right. Um, well, uh, so on the dairy, have we given you any direction, Michael, uh, <laughs> how to proceed with, uh, with, well, with the drafting part of that? See? So for dairy, I, I uh, I think I would use the chair's proposal, add to it the requirement that as a condition of acceptance that the 
Um, Farm agreed to an evaluation by a response team or a representative of the response team regarding methods or mechanisms to approve the operation of the farm, uh, including potential transition of the farm to additional or other commodities. Yeah, yeah, and you're uh, gonna go ahead. about adding in the the farms that are smaller you know, the other farms that the five or 600 or whatever it is, that, so that even the little guys would get, you know, the vegetable guys and, and the sheep guys and goats and whatever, the, sh the milking goats would be included uh, because they're considered dairy, but we want, I thought the committee would like to add in the, the vegetable guys, am I wrong with that? Or no, you're I, right, or, you're right. We need yeah. to. But, but could I, do you want those farms to have to go through an evaluation of whether or not they should transition? Oh. No, no, so maybe it's a separate, maybe it's a separate piece. Right, yeah. that's that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah, you do one for dairy, you do one for, for non-dairy. Non -dairy. Um, okay. And then you do, some of the other proposals that you want to do. Um, so I, that's what I was thinking. Then, then you do a, a program for non-dairy. They have to be subject to regulation as a farm or they have to be a farmer. And that the question is, how do you want to do that? There are, are as the chair indicated, there are income thresholds, say the current use income thresholds, or there's the federal income thresholds for, in order to declare yourself a farmer. Or you could say they have to be um, a farm subject to regulation under the RAPs, um, which is a different standard and not necessarily income-based. Um, so there's different ways to say who's a farmer. And once you've done that, you would go to basically a, a payment program, just like dairy by category um, and that could be implemented as I think Senator Hardy uh, requested um, by a, a nonprofit or, or another entity. See, the problem with, I mean, I want to do this, but the problem that we're going to have with it is we haven't heard, I don't think any testimony or verification that they have lost money and you know it's really just to help them out but i we haven't heard a word about about their viable business and what some of them have come in and said they're doing better than before so we got to be careful uh i don't know ruth or, or yeah uh, yeah i I mean, I think we did get some testimony about the drop in, um, for example, um, Blue Ledge Farm, uh, Hannah Sessions testified that in yeah. her first week, their sales dropped by 50%. And then she pivoted and was able to, you know, set up a farm stand and set up a website to do online ordering and all that stuff. So then their sales increased again. So I, I think it was more tied to not necessarily a loss in revenue, but expenses related to pivoting. And, and then, you know, the turkey farm needed to change up its operations to make it safe to do their meat processing or, you know, transport their workers or whatever they're gonna have to do. Um, so I think it's more not, unlike dairy, it's not about loss, it's about expenses related to to changing operations. So the yeah. meeting our food and meeting our food security needs as we go forward, which is the other piece of what we're trying to do. We keep, we should- I'll together. get you, Chris. Uh, Michael, is that the way you were intending to set that up? Uh, that's not what I just proposed, but I can easily, what I think you can do, and going back to Senator Hardy's reference to self-certification earlier, you set up this program that it's available for those farms that have experienced a loss or, or, or incurred an expense due to COVID. They self-certify that they have that expense and it's up to a certain amount per category of farm. 
right? And and then you have an audit authority, which will probably never get exercised or will be exercised very rarely. And then you have a penalty for those that provide false or, or um, intentionally misleading information. And so that, that is, it's based on loss. You reduce administration costs by having the self-certification, but you have significant penalties and an authority for audit, um, which will help people stay within the lines. Now, do we need a qualifier in there? Like you have to meet uh, the, the conditions to be in, in current use or federal guidelines on uh, becoming a, being taxed as a farm. Uh, what, what's the committee think about that? You know, whether we need those qualifiers in there. Well, I, I do think I do think we need something. Rural Vermont just sent me a clip from um, from the uh, USDA Ag Census from eight years ago, but it it fits that that claims there to be seven thousand farms in Vermont. So um, <laughs> we had better use that definition. We we need to understand the universe. It needs to be fair. I like the direction here that we're, we're, you know, we're going to create this. We're not going to send them all checks. It's an opportunity based on expenses or uh, losses. Um, but I also hope we can talk a little bit more about the broader infrastructure things related to food security. And I, I've been wondering if, if that might look like uh, increased funding to some existing programs whether it's working lands or whatever with a clear directive to have them uh, help us, um, you know, shore up food security uh, with the presumption that this crisis will last longer than three more months. Um, so I, I, I don't need to move us there immediately, but I think it's an important part of the discussion and, and has to be a priority. Yeah, why don't we try to get this one kind of wrapped up so Michael knows where we want to go and and then we'll get into your other suggestions and and a couple of others after that. Ruth? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, since people are watching us on YouTube, uh, Jackie Folsom, who would normally be in the room with us, um, told me that just related to maple that their restaurant orders are way down. So they're hurting because normally they would be selling to restaurants and events and institutions. Um, so they, they are, their sales have dropped pretty significantly. And she said that the maple open house weekend does bring in a lot of revenue for them. Um, just a quick. Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't know that. I didn't think of that either. So thank you, Jackie. <laughs> Um, and also the, uh, just a question for you, Michael, about the certification, the, the farms, the, those 53 farms that are certified, those would be required to meet water quality requirements, right? Because they're certified with the agency of ag. So with the other non-certified farms, are there any, is there any requirement for them to meet the RAPs or, or the water quality? So all farms are required to meet the RAPs at a minimum, and they have been since since the '90s. Um, so yes, the, they are subject to water quality requirements. Okay. Can I step away for five minutes now that I have to go deal with something? Sure. I'll be, I'll be back in one second. Yeah. Um, so um, pretty helpful having Michael with us. <laughs> Um, you know, some of the other, uh, what about uh, like hemp? Uh, we, we've got that coming over in a bill, but is, what about um, talking about a manufacturing type deal for hemp so they could at least sell the, the stocks and things for fiber? Is that anything that uh, would be of value to, you know, it would help they'd have to employ people. If we had something along those lines, I, but I don't know if, 
if that would work under yeah. under COVID money or, or not. Well, your district mate has told me, and I think Carrie has backed this up, that the um, most hemp in Vermont is, and, and Nataka White, if I'm rem remembering, who's been a longtime hemp guy in Vermont, yeah, said that they're not, that sort of industrial hemp that's grown in huge scale out on out in the Midwest, whereas our folks are much more interested in the cannabinoids, the CBD, and the, the dietary pieces of that. So I, I need to be convinced that, and and they're all summer season. So so maybe we will see them take a hit, but I'd need to be convinced that they have experienced uh, a loss at this point. They uh, have or haven't, Chris? I, I would need to be convinced that they have. I, oh. I, my guess is just because they're, um, just because they're not in the ground yet that they probably weren't as badly impacted. But that is part of a diversification discussion uh, to some degree that, you know. But that, I mean that, so that really isn't um, an issue that we need to deal with right now because they haven't come forward with a loss. Uh, what about, uh, we talked about supply chain. Have we also got that tied into something for to go out long term? I, I, I really want us to. I think that is clearly an infrastructure need and a food security need. Um, but I beats beats me how we do that at this point. Um, well, somebody, somebody. Well, I I think I know how we how we could do it as a lot of our fruits and and our veggies are you know black river produce uh you know they they've done a lot to enhance that with with their trucks running all around the state and being able to pick and deliver um well they you know they aren't just big here in vermont they're big elsewhere and somehow we got to set, I think, a, a, a committee or somebody up with them to work with Reinhardt uh, or Black River, whatever we want to call that company, uh, to, to make a deal with, with farmers that they have these little hubs that they would take all their produce to and they would stop there once a week, twice a week, and pick that produce up and market it through their salespeople. And, and that, that could also work like in Massachusetts. Uh, they could get that stuff to Burlington or wherever they hook up, congregate it uh, you know, in these big totes and ship it down to their place in mass to be distributed out but we need somebody to coordinating these little hubs to where farmers could take their stuff maybe maybe that's something we could find some money for and direct working lands to sort out you know and and normally we just say they, they've got their mission and we give them what we can but that strikes me as as it would be more of a directive than we've done, but <coughs> but we I, have I just, to put I'd like to in. I'd like to use systems that exist, um, and and has some expertise already. Uh, but the need is clear, the strategy seems good. How we execute it is the question. Well, should yeah, but. Couldn't we use covert money to uh, to build that system? I mean, there's certainly a loss of market there or for regional food security. There certainly isn't a market there right now. This would help put that together. No, I think you're right. I think we just need to figure it out a little bit more. It's also because it is a food security issue as well. If we want more local purchasing by schools and hospitals and institutions, and we want to 
build up those programs of Vermonters, feeding Vermonters, those kinds of things. It means we want well, farmers to produce more, but if they're producing more, they have to find have ways to store and process things as well in order to keep them on the market year round. Well, Michael, it, can the money be used uh, to for a long term food security, or is that something that it can't be used for? So, just looking at the Treasury's guidance and what they define as a secondary or second tier uh, expense. It includes providing economic support to those suffering from employment or business interruptions due to COVID-19 related business closures. I think you could make an argument that farmers and the food system itself is suffering from a business interruption due to COVID-19 related business closures. And to address future pandemic outbreaks um, yeah, if you good. want to develop a secure food system or, or strengthen the food system something like that well I think you I think we've got our answer guys <laughs> it's all we got to do is have Michael work the words and figure out this could go on the short term list maybe short and long but to uh, develop a food security, uh, regional food security type <coughs> system. And yeah, I think uh, short, short term, we could put it on, get it going. It might be medium or long term before it's actually in operation, but short term would be to. Yeah, we, we ought to get on that right off. And, and you know, um, back, I mean, back a little bit ago in this meeting, we talked about the 40 million, how it, you know, it's a lot of dollars. But if, if you break this thing down so you can really understand it instead of getting caught, caught up in trillions and billions and millions and get it down to dollars and cents, the 40 million, I don't know, maybe I've told you this already or explain it. It's like if you had $1,250 in your pocket and you got to a point where, God, I'd really like to take care of this situation. I don't know if I can or not. Well, you'd take $40 out of that $1,250 and that's what our 40 million is like against 1.25 billion. So we aren't, we aren't asking for a lot of the big pie. It just sounds like a tremendous amount of money. So don't, you know, don't let anybody fool you about talking about oh, you keep all those millions, <laughs> uh, Ruth and then Chris. I, I, that's a great analogy, Bobby. I just want to make sure that we're there, that if we do get lucky enough to get the 40 million for ag that we spend 40, dollars. 40 bucks, 40 <laughs> bucks, two twenties in my pocket, um, that we get, that we spend it broadly on agriculture yeah. and not just on, on oh. dairy and that we think long-term and big picture about how to make it more resilient. I, I love Michael's explanation of how this ties to COVID. I think that's really great. Um, I wanted to put in a plug for one other thing that we heard in testimony, which was the um, Spanish language farm safety yeah. and health um, training. Um, and it sounds like there's one already in existence in New York State that we could probably just, you know, copy for Vermont in some way, Vermontize. Um, and maybe we could direct UVM extension to do that um, since the ag department is or ag agency might be overwhelmed, but they already work a lot with farms. So I'm thinking that might be something to put in the package and that's relevant to COVID because making sure that our, all of our farm workers have the relevant information for farm safety and, and health and, and safety on the farm is important if, if this well, keeps coming. That, is that okay? You've got that on your list for short term, Ruth? Well, I, I wanted to bounce it off you guys and think, see no, what you thought, if we could include that, that in our package. Sure. 
Yeah, that's fine with Definitely. everybody, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. So add that on. Okay, Chris. I, I just want to go back to the the uh, broader conversation and uh, the idea of invest infrastructure strategies to deal with food security. Yeah. Uh, processing. You mentioned hemp. You know, one of the limitations, as I get as I understand it, is the processing end of that. And I guess I have a question for Senator Hardy. Has there been any discussion in your afternoon committee in education around the state college campuses? Because, you know, we, we had a few years ago, we had the idea that the old Windsor prison would be used for uh, as a hemp processing facility and that didn't work. And I'm not saying we want to transition Johnson State College to hemp processing, but ag processing somewhere in the Northeast Kingdom near the farms you know, that seems like, I, I just, I, 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 while we're in the early stages, I want to make sure we're connecting dots if they meet, if they're smart to be connected. If, if we find they're not to be, well, then let's not do it. But, but it does strike me that, you know, we've talked about food hubs, we've talked about aggregating, we've talked about distribution, and we've talked about processing. And we may well have a, an intense need to use current facilities a little bit differently and we happen to have two that are in the heart of ag uh, of the ag communities of vermont and, and i just want to I, I don't want to take that off the table I, I hope we can explore that just a little bit yeah that's a, i thank you for bringing up the state colleges chris we haven't had that conversation in our in the education committee um at least since this crisis has happened because the the sort of crisis management has not we're not that directly part of that crisis management in the ed committee un unfortunately i would love us to be but we're not but i think that your point about connecting the conversation about the state colleges to ag is really important in that i've heard from a lot of people about the fact that for example vermont tech um, is really important to the ag economy and you know creating uh not workers and 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 uh, you know systemic change in in the agriculture industry in Vermont, and we if we lose Vermont Tech and the Vermont State Colleges, that could have a big impact on agriculture. So um, I think that that's important to remember in this. And I don't know how we could necessarily connect it, um, but I think that's worth exploring and putting it in our package. Um, and I can put it on the list too. Um, but if you have ideas. That would be great to include. Brian. Thank you, Bob. Um, another thing, Ruth, maybe on the list, I know this is small potatoes, pun intended, um, but I'm still mystified why we couldn't figure a way to let people who are grocery shopping know that there's plenty of milk, there's plenty of cheese, there's plenty of all that sort of product. And in the end, I don't know whether if everybody bought an extra gallon of milk or pound of cheese, it would have made too much of a difference. But to just have a sign up that says that you are limited to buying a certain amount to me is absolutely ludicrous when we know that we're making plenty of milk. I mean, we're producing it. Now, maybe it's not getting to the, the shelf. I understand that. And that's a supply chain problem. I understand that too. But there seems to be a disconnect between what people are being told and what reality is. I know. We've been told, I think, <coughs> on our regular committee meetings that all the signs have come down and that they, you know, have um, the ag agency has um, issued uh, letters to the stores and all this about getting those signs down uh, and, uh, you know, and letting people buy what they want to buy. Uh, because what I've heard is. You know, the older folks uh, like me uh, could catch uh, the, the Canova virus pretty easy. So you send the kids in and then they go to the store and they want to buy three or four gallons of milk so they can bring it home to the older folks and they can't get it. They can only get one, one gallon. But uh, I think that, I think the agency has taken care of that. To okay. some 
And then on food and food security, um, you've probably all seen on, on the news about DFA uh, taking milk uh, to Hoods and to the yogurt factory. And, and, you know, I don't know if there's some way that we could get in on we could get in on that through uh, Culvert 19 to funnel some money to promote that type of thing rather than wasting that food, uh, that milk, um, you know, destroying it. Uh, it I think it costs fifty thousand dollars to do to do that one trailer load of milk or something. So it, it's about a dollar a gallon that it gets to the food shelf or to the food bank. It, it gets to them and it costs about a dollar a gallon for milk and it costs 42 cents for, for the yogurt stuff. And I don't know if we should get some money to the food bank somehow, if that would be possible. Uh, I think community loan, no, what, community loan foundation has, has picked up. The community, community foundation. Community foundation? Yes. I mean, is that anything worth talking about or? or? Probably. Yeah, it's the Vermont Community Foundation that's that's gotten, at least they did the first load and I'm not sure if they're doing the second one, but they're trying to raise more money for it. But I, Anthony, do you know if this is part of the Vermonters feeding Vermonters request from the food bank? Would they be putting some money toward that type of thing? Uh, you, you've you been more- I don't, know, I don't know if they've imagined doing much with dairy, but I imagine they'd be open to it. I don't know, we'd have to ask them whether dairy is part of what they're, I, I imagine they're thinking more of like shelf, longer shelf life stuff, but I could be wrong. Didn't I think they they'd be open to, to the idea. Even before all of this, they were in asking us for money. And how much were they asking for? Do you remember? I really don't remember, but I remember they were there asking us both in the committee and in the hallway. So yeah, I think it was 500,000 is what I remember. Something yeah. like that. Yes. And at, at the time, that seemed like a ton of money. Seems like a lot of money, right? Now, it, now maybe not. <laughs> um, now we got 40 million to spend. It's, very, it's not much when you've got 40 million in your pocket. I mean, if Bobby's talking about 40 bucks, we should just make it 50, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, we, but we, we're we going to need to wrap here, Mr. Chair. I wanted to remind you that you wanted us to talk about scheduling. Yeah, uh, next week. Uh, yeah. What, what do you think about uh, Mondays or... See, Linda's got a conflict, I think, on Tuesday. Are you on there, Linda? Yes. Yeah, uh, is it Tuesday that you're tied up? Yes, uh, the House Agriculture Committee meets Tuesday morning. That is a possibility. Somebody else could host it. I did get permission from uh, Tim Ash's office that you can meet on Monday, if you wish. So it would be Monday and Thursday? Well, no, you're on the floor Tuesday and Thursday. We uh, usually have the Wednesday, 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 9.30 to 12 has been a regular time. So we could do Monday, skip a day, Wednesday, or we could do Tuesday and, and I, Thursday. So you're Thursday. On, Thursday. Tuesday and Thursday, Thursday you're on the floor. You're on the floor right. Tuesday at 9.30 and Thursday at 1 p.m. <laughs> So we could do a shorter meeting. I, I'm happy to host. That's not a big deal. I do Zoom calls for work. So um, if that takes care of things, I'm happy to help that way. So you want to do like we normally do then? Meaning, meaning Monday and Wednesday? Well, I'm confused. What days are we talking See, about? Yeah, I think we should meet twice next week. One, to get all the farm groups in and and hear if they've got suggestions and and things they they want to talk to us about and then the next the next second meeting uh gus wants to come in and uh we so we could do gus and we've got something else i've got listed that we need to do 
a walkthrough. A walkthrough of the a house bill H six fifty six on yeah, the other day. Michael to present the uh, the the miscellaneous bill to us. Michael. So uh, I would recommend, or uh, someone you might want to hear from, is Cassie Bohamus from Beta and the Ag Credit Corporation. Uh -huh. She yeah. uh, might might have some options that would be available to both dairy and non-dairy farmers that are financed through VITA. Um, and uh, so she said the, the interest buy down that's in the current dairy assistance draft isn't gonna work as, especially with the money that's appropriated for it, but she'd yeah. be willing to talk to you about options that, that she could think that might help both dairy and uh, non-dairy. Um, how long? How long would it take you, Michael, to run through the miscellaneous ag bill from the house that's coming our way? You're Can muted, you? Michael. You're muted. You. It's about you. 27 sections long, um, <laughs> and there's some some interesting stuff in there, like feral pigs, <laughs> and. Uh, <sighs> <laughs> hemp, um, but you've already done hemp, so you wouldn't need to to spend a lot of time on that. Um, I, could, I could probably do it in forty five minutes. But can we do that after we get this pulled together in a little clearer picture? Well, we could we could um, we could push that out here from the lady from uh, Vita and work go back to work on this stuff yeah, you know, I just we, make sure we have time as a committee to just to to get to where we want to with all of this and if we get too many people in here testifying then we're gonna not have our own time to work on the bill since we have a shortened you remember we usually have four days a week now we only have two shorter periods <laughs> yeah y'all yeah. like to talk so I'm wondering if Michael could put together this whole big package. You've gotten some pieces drafted. If you can put it together as one package. So uh, I've just made an outline for myself about what the package would be. Um, should I just run through that quickly? Yeah, sure. So first there would be uh, dairy assistance uh, that would be based on the chair's language, but adding a transitional provision uh, requiring, a, requiring an evaluation of a farm. Um, then there would be a program and good for- standing. And good and standing. And good standing, good standing. Uh, and then uh, a non-dairy program based on losses that a farm incurred or expenses that they incurred due to COVID-19 would be on a self-certified basis administered by a contractor with audit slash penalty authority to ensure um, to ensure the uh, credibility of the program. Then there would be a farm worker assistance program based on Senator Hardy's language. Um, still need to vet out those numbers a little bit, but we have a general like a thousand to 1200 worker number right there. Um, then there would be a public health training component for Spanish language um, for COVID and worker safety. Uh, then there would be a food system, um, food security component with a short-term and a long-term stage. Short-term would be uh, basically creating a, a either the working, charging working lands board or some other entity to develop recommendations for the long-term food security of, of Vermont based on strengthening the food system. And then the, that would lead to the long-term implementation probably in August or September of, of their recommendations. Is that consistent with what you want? Look good, sound good guys? Yeah, can I just, I was, yes, it does. Um, things that are not necessarily on that list, maybe they don't need to be, but we've talked also about um, increasing the supply, the program that, the hunger programs, basically, the nutrition programs, better, more fully funding those things and also encouraging more institutional buying. 
So I don't know if they have to be part of this package, but because we haven't talked about them in any detail, but the idea of um, better funding for the farm, Vermonters feeding Vermonters and the farm share program, those things, as well as increasing the um, requirements for purchasing local foods by schools and other state funded institutions. Yeah, that was P my and Pearson's bill that we, is that what you're talking about, Anthony? The yeah, basically and pushing it up as far as we can realistically. Yeah. Terms of setting setting goals. Yeah, the one problem is I, I don't want to put any stress on schools right now. They are uh, so uh, to the extent that that requires schools to do extra stuff. No, not uh, now, not in the short. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying, but not. Oh, in the long short. term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And Michael, part of it would be also I think we have to. You already know this, but in terms of the transition, we would need to. There's been talk about hiring more business planners at I guess VHCB or somewhere. It already does this stuff, so we might want to put in a placeholder just to hire more staff to help with the transition of dairy farmers. Well, we had that tied in somewhere, didn't we, Michael? You yeah, have, Michael said they only have like five or six people on staff. Do we need more people than that to do it? Right, right. I think you're going to have to create some sort of team or, or or task force that's going to be doing the evaluations of dairy farms that receive the assistance right, um, right. and that, that's 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 part of what i've got down okay yeah. it might be interesting as an idea just a brainstorm but um having active farmers actually meet with the dairy farmers you know have vegetable farmers or meat farmers meet with the dairy farmers to talk about how their how their operation could be different uh, Brian, you had a question? Yeah, well, I'm just anticipating Linda's needs here as best as I can. So if the House is not going to vote on that miscellaneous bill or housekeeping, whatever it's called, until Wednesday, it doesn't seem to make any sense for us to meet until Thursday to consider it, because if they change it, we're going to have to go back over it again anyway. Just a thought. So yeah. I would say Tuesday and Thursday next week, Assuming Michael can pull together by Tuesday all the things that we've talked about on the other part of it. Um, is that so on, on Tuesday, I'm already scheduled in Senate Natural to do solid waste issues. Okay. And, and the Senate's on the floor Tuesday at 930. What about uh, Thursday, Linda? Thursday, the Senate's on the floor at 1. So we How could about do Wednesday and Friday? Wednesday and Friday? Yeah, Wednesday and Friday morning, because then we could do two, and then we're not on doing the same days that we're on the floor. Does that That's work? Or we could do Friday? Monday. Should we or not Monday. Do Monday? Monday's a one, two. Yeah. Why don't we do Monday and Wednesday, and we can, that way we can get back onto this uh, maybe before we forget where we are. And that would give us the option of deciding we want to meet for a little while on Friday, depending on how things go. Okay. Yeah. You want to, how okay. long will you need, Michael, to do your work on this subject that we're on this morning? Uh, to flesh <laughs> out the entire package, that's probably not going to be done until, well, I have dairy assistance. I have farm worker assistance i can put together the non-dairy pretty quickly you know i i could probably have a framework for you by monday morning so why don't we get back onto this monday and then we'll do the or have you called the farm groups linda no we can and you also that. need to we could do them on Wednesday, but we also need some time for Gus. Would you want him on Wednesday or Monday? Well, either Wednesday or Friday. Oh, we'll see how we make out Wednesday, but we'll get back onto this while it's still all fresh in our minds. All right. But what about you talking about farm groups? Would they invite a few of them in on Monday? Is that what well, you're saying? That's what I was thinking. But... Yeah, no, I, I agree. I just want to be clear that that's what we're talking about. I think that's a good idea. I think because I think even with groups like World Vermont or NOFA, they could fill in some of the gaps in our thinking, like what size grants would make sense for vegetable farmers, that kind of stuff that we're sort of floundering around and 
brainstorming, they could give us a, some more concrete ideas as to what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, we'll get, we'll get there. We just got to do some calculating. So we'll do we'll do the farm groups on Monday. We'll meet on as a committee on the next the second time. And then we'll do Gus and his uh, crew on Friday. It'll be a short meeting. Would that work? Sure. Yeah, sure. As long as we have time on Monday before we hear from everybody to just take a peek at the bill that Michael puts together for us. Uh, what time is convenient for you guys? Well, Anthony and I have a meeting at noon on Monday, so we just have to be done in time. No. That. Could we start at nine? Eight thirty. Sure. I don't care. The earlier, the better for me. Eight thirty. Nine sounds good to me. Nine. <laughs> okay. We'll, okay. We'll start at nine with us. Punch in at nine thirty live and get the groups in. Okay. okay. So you and could punch. We could punch in at quarter of nine. Sure. But we we have to be live for the whole discussion, Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. But so if we start punching in at at uh, nine, then and we'll go live at nine thirty. No, we have to be live if we're talking about the bill. Oh, if we're talking about policy, we have to be we live. Have to be live. Facebook. So we. We just we start at nine the first half hour we all out live and we talk about the bill and then at nine thirty we can have the groups come in. Okay. Yeah. Well, Michael said he'd need about forty five minutes, so could I have the groups come in at ten, giving you an well, Michael hour? Michael was saying that I thought for the house bill, right? We're not oh. doing that. Today. Oh. Okay, so you That's don't need that. Gotcha. Ruth and right. our bill, the bill that we're that we're brainstorming yeah. now. Okay, ten's fine too. I mean, we can we can certainly talk. Look, we proved it today. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, are we all set then? Are you good, Linda? So you know the schedule. Um, you if you'll stay on a minute after we go go <laughs> off air, so I can confirm the schedule. That would be great. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. I gotta okay, so go. We'll go yeah, off the okay. air now. Yes. yes. Bye, Thanks a lot. Everybody. Thank you.